where you can, uh, I'm not, not sure if you can still sign up Python code, probably yes, and you, but definitely you can vote for them uh, and they will be presented at this of the day. And let me introduce uh, Cody, who is a uh, technical act manager uh, for system management, system manageability and security in Red Hat. He will tell you something about what customers actually do with the security. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I've had the opportunity over the last couple of years to uh, talk with a number of customers on a variety of subjects, one of which is security. And you may be shocked to hear that there are some disconnects between what we believe about security and what our customers actually do. So I would like to go into that a little bit, talk about uh, what the customers are doing, why they're doing it that way, what the considerations are, uh, perhaps offer some insights into behavior and <clears throat> some things that need to be done to get customers to uh, adopt a more proactive security strategy. So, security. That means keep the bad guys out, right? Well, that may be just a touch narrowly focused and maybe we should look at a slightly bigger picture. So I'm going to start off with some of those philosophical stuff before diving into it a little bit. And if there are pieces that uh, make no sense, if you have questions or if you simply feel a uh, compulsion to scream at me, feel free to scream. At a very high level, <clears throat> why do customers have computers? Why do they have IT? What are they doing with all this stuff? From a customer perspective, the sole reason for this is to create business value. Business value means either money coming into the company or quantifiable hard dollars saved. So software doesn't have any inherent value. Hardware doesn't have any in value, inherent value. Operating systems don't have any inherent value. Customers run applications. <clears throat> An application like SAP. SAP as a piece of software has essentially no business value. However, having the right parts at the right place at the right time to build and ship a product has tremendous value. <clears throat> having accurate and detailed cost information so that you can set prices profitably yet competitively has tremendous value. Something a little bit closer to uh, most of us, email. <coughs> Zimbra has no value in and of itself. I, I suspect we all agree on this. <laughs> However, the value is the exchange of information. So it's the ability to exchange and find information <coughs> that is the value. So business value is what our customers are interested in. Business value in this area comes through the combination of applications, primarily ISV applications, data, and users. So the combination of these three is what produces the business value. Applications run on top of some sort of um, infrastructure and support. You have the operating system, which does resource management and provides hardware abstraction. You have the hardware. You have storage and networks. All of these exist to support the application, and the application is to support the combination of the business process, the data, and the users. User requirements, from an application perspective, are pretty straightforward. They require availability. The application has to be available. The application services have to be available when they need them. Closely related, and I would argue as a part of um, availability, is performance. A interactive application with same day response time is not considered a good thing. Bugzilla, anyone? <laughs> and then integrity. And all this centered around the applications. All right. So what is this integrity thing? Integrity means that the application returns the expected results. It means that the application and the data are available to authorized users and 
and counterpoint <coughs> are not available to unauthorized users. It means that the system and the applications have not been modified in any unapproved fashion and that all modifications and attempts at modification are reported. It means that the <coughs> applications, the system, the data can be verified and validated so that you can trust it. And then integrity also includes resilience. The system should continue to function and function correctly in the presence of a variety of threats. All right. Let's take a look at a running system and something that uh, we're calling operational integrity. So operational integrity means that the application services are available, that you can trust the results, both of the computation and of the underlying data, that the system has resilience to various threats, to attacks, to uh, environmental factors, even to human error. And from my perspective, a system that's resilient to uh, human error is amazing and is probably the most difficult challenge to deal with. In terms of operations, <clears throat> it means that the um, system and the application maintain the integrity of the application services over the life of the system, which is a multi-year period. For enterprise applications in familiar in particular, you install once and then you run them for years. For enterprise applications, you install once and run for decades. Old software never dies, it just stays at our customers, causing us increasing heartburn. Okay, that, that's, that's some of the background. That's uh, intended to give you an idea of where I'm coming from in some of these discussions. So, we're talking about security. Security pretty well involves threats. So, who is the greatest threat? Now, when you talk about security threats, the first thing that everyone thinks of is Igor the hacker, the highly skilled, perhaps with state level resources, who is um, out to accomplish high level goals, which is either make or steal large amounts of money, the entire credit card um, identity theft and all of that, or um, espionage at various levels, either commercial or state-sponsored. Now, I'm going to argue that Igor is a little bit overblown, that there are some cases where you have to worry about um, Igor, but he is certainly not the only threat. A much more broad threat is Sphinx the script kitty. Doesn't know what the hell he does, but has an extremely high opinion of himself. So, uh, the big challenge with Sphinx is there's a lot of him, and while he doesn't know how they work, he has access to some annoyingly powerful and capable toolkits. Now, Sphinx is normally out to uh, deface systems and make a nuisance of himself, not terribly sophisticated in most cases, and is probably not a direct commercial threat to your ERP system, but this is where your websites get defaced. Now, protecting against Sphinx, well, if it's a brochureware website that doesn't really have any valuable content on it, like corporate websites on the uh, <clears throat> web tend to be, then perhaps you don't worry about hardening the system too much, you just <clears throat> are ready to re-image it whenever something happens. So we're starting to say, okay, there are different ways of responding to the threats. Fred, the system administrator. I really wanted to put Snowden in there, but uh, discretion <clears throat> was the better part of valor in this case. The system admin is probably the single greatest threat to a system. And, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do in software to stop a sysadmin. Sally the user. Uh, has anyone here dealt with 
users. <laughs> they, <clears throat> they are terribly creative, aren't they? <laughs> now, Sally doesn't have malice. Sally is trying to do a good job. Sally doesn't understand the details of the system. Sally makes mistakes, has misunderstandings. <clears throat> Sally is not going to be hacking your system, but man, can she hose your data. <laughs> Stan the security czar. Has anyone ever dealt with a customer situation where the systems are so locked down that you can't even freaking log into them? All right, you let Stan have his way, and you are going to end up with unusable systems. Now, remember, the whole purpose of these systems is to produce business value, and Stan, in the uh, name of security, given a chance, is going to prevent these systems from generating business value. Does anyone see a potential issue here? Sam, the disgruntled employee. Unlike Sally, he has malice on his mind and may be out for revenge, may simply be out to uh, steal information. William, the manager. Has anyone had their budget for absolutely critical things cut? Only one person? Uh, okay, I, I'm really having trouble believing this. <laughs> Sam control or William controls the um, the resources, controls the policy. William is the guy that's going to say the security stuff is getting in our way. Turn it off. So, William is focused on getting his job done, and usually not through malice, and notice I said usually, uh, will make decisions that are arguably the best for business interests, but may have significant <coughs> security implications. Tom the programmer, I don't think I need to say anything more here. <laughs> Dave the service technician, has anyone run RAID. Have you ever had a dry failure in a RAID set? Has anyone ever seen the wrong drive pulled? <laughs> yeah, that, that, <laughs> that can be bad. Dennis the Weatherman. Now, in the Superstorm Sandy last year, which put hundreds of New York data centers underwater. So uh, I'm using uh, Dennis as a proxy for floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, brush fires, all of the environmental factors that can threaten anything from a data center to a broad infrastructure. And then with network systems, <clears throat> has anyone heard the phrase backhoe fade, where a construction worker cuts your network link, usually in a field 300 miles from nowhere, where it takes time to locate and get someone out there and fix it. All right. <clears throat> All of these are threats to system integrity. Some of them are threats to system security directly, but all of these factors threaten the operation of a system. What would you suggest is the greatest security threat? Anyone? Is anyone awake? Dan, what is the greatest security threat? All right. I will suggest that the greatest security threat is the yellow <laughs> sticky of doom. <laughs> now this is actually a proxy for the larger threat. The yellow sticky of, zoom, of doom is an example of the law of unintended consequences. In this case, 
any feature of the system that prevents the users from doing their job will be worked around. It's more secure to have a 22 character password with uppercase, lowercase numbers, and special characters that's changed every month than a <coughs> fixed eight character password, right? Because the long, rapidly changing passwords can't be remembered and yellow sticky of doom. So keep in mind when you're building uh, systems, particularly when you're looking at security factors, the law of unintended consequences that if it gets in the way, people will work around it. Period. Full stop. In talking with customers, <clears throat> what are they, have you ever heard, well, with open source, everyone can read the source code, so it's inherently insecure. Well, yeah, everyone can read the source code. But there's increasing study that uh, <clears throat> says the secret to health is eating dirt as a child. Now, you, it builds up the immune system. Now, if the systems are going to exist in the real world, they're going to need to be healthy. They're going to need to be robust. They're going to need to be resilient. And how much of that can you expect to achieve as a bubble baby or a closed source application? Okay, <clears throat> what needs to be done? We need to deter threats to availability and integrity <clears throat> from whatever source. This is where a lot of the things that uh, we do in security and on the software side are focused. However, <clears throat> there are multi levels of response. We, can, we cannot pardon a system to the point it's completely secure. There's a famous saying that the only truly <coughs> secure computer system is one that's melted into slag, put in a lead vault, and dumped into the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And there's some people that suggest even that is not completely secure. So if we accept that we're not going to be able to deter all threats, then we have to deal with them. Dealing with the threats means detecting any challenges to availability and security. <coughs> And it means responding to these challenges, both proactively and reactively. So a lot of things that are done uh, to respond to the threats can be done proactively. But there are also cases where you can uh, detect an attack or other event in progress and respond to it, either while it's current or later on. Responding to the threat may involve detecting it going Oh, crap, wiping the system and reinstalling everything from scratch. Now, <clears throat> that's a severe case. It's not terribly productive, but there are some cases where that is the most. And anything, any effective system is going to involve defense in depth. Software absolutely plays a role in it. Systems, system design absolutely play a role. Policies may have a greater impact than some of the lower level features. And ultimately, your systems and your system's integrity are going to depend on people. So what should we do? We should consider all threats to availability, not just Igor the hacker. We need to prioritize these threats <clears throat> in terms of cost and terms of um, the cost both to uh, prepare for the threat as well as the cost if the threat actually occurs. And we need to prioritize things. How many people have customers with a unlimited budget? We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> You're always constrained. Now, you can uh, either implement things because it feels good, there's some thread out there, belt and suspenders, or you can have a prioritized list of threats that you're facing and determine how to respond to those most effectively 
and most cost effectively. Okay, what about security? I think you can guess that we're leading up to the suggestion that security is one threat <coughs> among many that <coughs> challenge system integrity. That the security is much broader than just software. Security is not something you buy. It's an entire process. And <coughs> that I'm going to suggest that we need to be careful to avoid overemphasis on security, particularly if it's um, at the cost of impacting applications or impacting usability of the system. Now, just to argue with myself, I'm schizophrenic and so am I, uh, the other side of it is we need to be careful that we do not underemphasize security. So we've got to strike a balance. We need to consider security and the concept, uh, context of the overall threat matrix and see, all right, looking up for the next year, do we need to spend, do we, the customer, need to be spending money on certain types of system hardening or getting a backup generator for the data center? So there are some hard business decisions that need to be made and security is one factor among many that needs to be considered. Now, what do our customers actually do? Security is our number one concern. We have firewalls um, around the perimeter and we have all of our servers on secured internal networks. We're covered. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many customers I have heard this from, including frighteningly major financial institutions. So <clears throat> that's what uh, customers do. Perimeter security, yep, across the board, everyone has perimeter security. And in far too many cases, that is their primary security mechanism. The next thing is that customers actually do minimal installs. And one of the major requests that we get from a security perspective is to make our minimal install smaller. So what they want to do is have the minimal system as a starting point, add only the stuff that they need on top of it, and run this as a production server, both because it's uh, lean and mean, and because the less the stuff that's installed on the box, the smaller your attack surface. So anything that we do around minimal install is going to be well received. System audits. Pretty much across the board, people do system audits. In many cases, the system audits are done manually. And at many customers, system audits are done every six months. At other customers, they're supposed to be done every six months, but they actually happen on a year or sometimes two years. So. Customers are doing audits. They're not doing them effectively. This is an opportunity. The other thing that customers do is turn off SE Linux. How many people think turning off SE Linux is a bad idea? All right. SAP, the ERP application, <clears throat> as an example of an ISV application, many of the ISV applications do not function with SE Linux in enforcing mode. So if a customer is faced with a decision, I can either run SAP or I can turn on SE Linux or I can run another system where people don't annoy me about this. It doesn't have the protections of SE Linux, but <clears throat> that's a side issue. What do you think they're going to do? Right. <clears throat> The other, th other thing that is done almost across the board is turning off the Linux firewall. And in this case, the reason that they turn off the Linux firewall is that there is no way to centrally manage the firewalls on the Linux systems. This is one of the reasons that we're looking forward to firewall D because firewall D provides the core <coughs> infrastructure 
for enabling centralized management of firewalls on Linux and is going to allow us to reopen the um, discussion with customers <coughs> to turn the freaking firewall on. So this is a case that everyone agrees that it's a good idea, but it doesn't work in the operational environment. So there are a lot of things that uh, we can do that they're great ideas, but for a variety of reasons, they don't work in an operational environment, and we need to be very much aware of that. <sighs> the other thing that our customers do is they minimize system patching. Uh, many of the customers have a patch window on a three-month basis. Looking at production servers, one of the easiest uh, environments we encountered was where they had a six-hour window every three months. Other customers have a 15-minute window every six months, and there's a significant set that are looking for continuous availability of the systems, and they have no planned downtime. Now, the result of this <coughs> is that they don't patch as often as we would like. They're also afraid of our patches because... Does anyone have a customer where they've installed a Red Hat patch and it's impacted operation of the system or their applications? So, yeah, they're gun shy. On production servers, they're very concerned about stability. <clears throat> right, so what should we be doing? We and the customers should absolutely be hardening the systems but it needs to be done appropriately. And we have to remember that uh, the reason for that system is to run the applications and to deliver business value. Whatever is done to harden the system cannot interfere with the generation of business value. And that's kind of tough because there are a lot of uh, problems that, yeah, that's, that's a really hard requirement. Need to maintain uh, security and operations. There are a lot of things around operations, operations management, policies, procedures, maintenance, lifecycle management, change man management, configuration control that impact everything, specifically including security. We need to be very aggressive about detecting issues. Now, this is an area where uh, most customers uh, rely on other uh, systems to do this, Nagios and similar uh, systems for monitoring, a uh, variety of systems for intrusion detection, and uh, so forth. So uh, that's good for monitoring and even alerting, but it's critical to have system logs that, are, that contain the information that you need and are trustworthy. And it's um, also important to uh, audit the logs, that <clears throat> there should be routine uh, monitoring of logs on a daily basis, and it's good practice to do deeper dives into the logs on a routine schedule. Responding to issues, either automated response or various methods of mitigation and um, <clears throat> system recovery. So looking at system hardening, there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, system configuration is one of the big ones. SE Linux, firewalls are great for hardening the systems. Um, authentication, two-factor authentication is wonderful. Uh, two-factor authentication goes a long way towards mitigating the yellow sticky of doom. However, if you're going to be doing two-factor auth, uh, you should probably be spending a significant amount of investment in single sign-on. Does anyone use Mojo voluntarily? <laughs> uh, from my perspective, this is an example of two-factor auth done wrong. You have to log in using the two-factor authentication, which means digging out the phone, going into uh, the application, getting the PIN every time you access it. And <clears throat> I've seen significant discussion that people avoid using the system because of the effort of the login. 
oh, this looks interesting. Oh, I have to log in. Oh, look over here. A lot of unintended consequences. Two-factor auth helps security, but what does security mean if it causes people to avoid using the system? Something to keep in mind. Okay, a bunch of other things in there. This is actually the stuff that we're familiar with. Tools for system hardening. There's a set out there, and we're going to be seeing some really interesting work over the next uh, couple of years because the entire <coughs> container and control group capabilities are now starting to come into play. Linux containers, <coughs> great technology. Linux containers have been out in RHEL 6 for quite a while. For mere mortals, unusable. A lot of power, a lot of technical capabilities, too complex to use. Has anyone heard of Docker? The thing about Docker is, to a large degree, it civilizes containers. Uh, how much discussion do you hear about containers and namespaces and control groups and other things in the context of Docker? <laughs> and not that much. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen, not that much because the customers are focused on the value to the customer. And in terms of the underlying technology, if it works, it's effective, it's cost effective, and it doesn't get in their way. They don't care if it's <coughs> C groups and um, namespaces or a squirrel on a wheel. If it works, they don't care how it's done. Okay, operational approach to security. We've covered a lot of these pieces. Basic hardening, particularly at system install, and then system management, maintenance, and audit compliant remediation are <coughs> the most common um, and effective approaches to security. I actually <coughs> have some good news. And I'm going to say some nice things about work that <coughs> we're doing in the security space. Audit is a central focus point for a lot of our customers' security practices. We have a pretty <coughs> good tool in this area that in the best Red Hat tradition, we forgot to tell people about. SCAP. How many people are familiar with SCAP? You're Red Hatters. <laughs> <coughs> the thing about SCAP is it's got a pretty effective scanning engine. It's got a set of available content. Not nearly enough. Content is its greatest weakness. But uh, the greatest strength of SCAP is it not only does a good job, but it presents the information in a way that mere mortals can use it. So this is a SCAP report. We've got information on the system. We've got the test. We've got uh, the results of it. All right. That's all you need, isn't it? Uh, no. All right. Here's one of the tests. Ensure GPG check enabled rule when this was run, severity, what this is all about, what you need to do to uh, fix it, and some more general information on it. That is so simple and so good, I can understand it, and that is an impressive achievement for the authors. All right. Uh-oh, fail. Now, Fail looks bad, but what does it actually mean? All right, set password minimum length. Okay, severity medium. Okay, what it is, where it's at, and some general discussion on it. You know, maybe this isn't a real failure. Maybe uh, there's using two-factor auth 
and allowing six character uh, base passwords or something like that. But this gives you a fighting chance to not only understand what the failure was, but what the implications are. And one of the things that doesn't show up on these examples, but if a test and successful failure is due to a CVE, it reports the CVE so that you can understand, um, <clears throat> go back, do further research on it. You can also see which patches will resolve that CVE. So SCAP is <clears throat> seriously uh, good stuff. System logging, yep, we need to do it. <laughs> Key customer considerations. Ease of use. Number two, centralized management. <clears throat> How many of your customers have more than 10,000 machines or virtual machines? All right, I know that more of your customers have that. We've got ridiculous amounts of server sprawl. Single machine management is no longer enough. Anything that's going to be widely used, particularly in security, has to be centrally managed. Regulatory guidelines are a big deal. Whole product, <clears throat> we're kind of running out of time. The basic idea of whole product is everything that the customer needs to do their job. It includes the core product with shelf in the bottom. It includes uh, <clears throat> the interface, uh, support. It includes awareness that something exists. It doesn't matter how good it is, if no one knows that it exists, it's not going to be used. So whole product <clears throat> is generic product and everything that's needed. There's several components to it. This, incidentally, is something that you're going to be hearing more about. <clears throat> we're starting to include a lot of the whole product uh, concepts in the work we're doing, which means that just writing containers isn't enough. We need to have the whole ecosystem. Recommendations. Build security into your operational plans. Know where your software comes from. Well. If you're getting a lot of community distributions, it's not necessarily easy to be sure of that, but Red Hat Enterprise Linux with the signed RPMs, you know where those come from. Install only what is needed. Patch your system, yes. <clears throat> Avoid getting root access unless it's absolutely needed. Encrypt, we're starting to see a lot more interest in encryption, but encrypt wisely. Now. Encryption is a little bit of a mixed bag for us. We've got pretty good encryption capabilities, both on the wire and <clears throat> on disk. However, we do not have a centralized key management capability, and that's <clears throat> one of our greatest weaknesses around crypto today. Well, someone said something? Let's talk. <clears throat> Need to benchmark security, both in terms of functional capabilities, in terms of performance, <clears throat> and in terms of usability. Monitor the system. Remember law of unintended consequences. Uh, a lot of security is really just good operational practice. Baseline security is simply good hygiene. And as a paid political message, the number one thing for security is to run Linux. Any questions? Steve. Uh, not, not going to happen. The, the perimeter is dead. The perimeter is gone. 